I've known Jay uh, for a long time now, probably 25, 30 years. Um, it's been a while, but, that's for sure. <laughs> sir, yeah, it sounds a lot longer than what it feels like, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. But I uh, grew up in Cherville. I live in Belmont, a uh, small suburb of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. So about 15, 20 minutes outside of Charlotte and uh, practice law in Gastonia. And I've been practicing law uh, for about 10 years this October. So, wow, that's cool, man. Um, all right. So what, what we're going to do is we're going to jump right into it and start off at your, uh, when you were young. So tell us about your childhood. Like you said, you're, you're from my hometown. That's how we know each other. And, uh, right. so do you have any siblings? Like, like, tell me about, about your childhood, your parents, all that stuff. All right. So I, I grew up in a traditional household, uh, mom and dad and a little brother. I was the oldest of two kids. Um, both of my uh, grandparents and extended families uh, were located centrally around Cherville. So uh, very close knit family on both sides. I was very fortunate to have that. Um, went to Cherville uh, schools, uh, Cher again, Cherville for uh, some of your audience, it's not familiar. Very small community, about 5,500 people, um, about 35, 40 minutes from Charlotte. Uh, small schools. It's almost like attending a private school in a, in a sense that uh, it's a very close-knit uh, school and community. Your graduating class was maybe 85, 90 people. Um, and so uh, pretty much typical childhood uh, in middle America, uh, I guess you could say. Um, ended up graduating in Cherville High School. Um, our families would always have big Sunday dinners, and so we'd sit around the table. We'd talk Cherville gossip, of course. Cherville is a small town. Everyone knows everybody. And so we'd talk uh, the local gossip. We'd always get into politics and then church politics, too. So, um, you know, heated discussions around the table. So that was always a huge influence on me growing up, listening to my relatives talk politics. Um, and then that carried over, I guess, into my professional life later on. Uh, or at least in school, as far as my interests, I, I like studying government. Um, I, I like science too. And it's funny how I ended up becoming a lawyer or studying what I did. Uh, so I went to Appalachian State University uh, for college. And, uh, but when you go to or attend to most colleges here in the United States, uh, you start off with an orientation and they'll let you know you know, where your classes are going to be or that sort of thing. And so I had two choices. I was thinking of studying either physics uh, and becoming an engineer, maybe working on a NASCAR team or something like that, <laughs> or political science. And uh, ironically, I attended the political science department meeting and forgot about the physics one. And essentially the rest is history. I, I knew the poli sci place. It was the path of least resistance and so ended up doing that just being familiar with it at Appalachian State but I haven't looked back um, I did four years at Appalachian State um, majored in political science with a concentration in pre-law took a lot of uh, legal courses or had a, a a good legal foundation by the time I went to law school also had a minor in business and criminal justice and knocked all that out in four years and then went straight through to law school cool but, man um, so, so tell me, what, what were you like in high school? Like, where did where did so you? So in high school, yeah. uh, I probably would have been one of the folks that uh, you might have been least likely to, to think uh, or imagine becoming a lawyer, or at the very least, a prosecutor. Um, I was more laid back. Uh, I tried to stay out of trouble, and I, I think I did a good job of doing that. As far as a student, I probably wasn't the best student that I could have been. Um, I love playing video games. I love hanging out with my friends and uh, listening to music. And so uh, I wasn't I wasn't a, a true straight A student in uh, um, high school, but I did have a little bit of scholarship money from Appalachian. Uh, best friends ended up going to Appalachian, mm -hmm. and uh, and one of our friends I think was actually even paid to to attend Appalachian. But um, but you know I, I probably looking back. I, I probably could have put in a lot more effort, um, but I did enough to get me where I am today. And so I'm thankful that I at least did that. But um, sometimes I look back and I'm like, man, I, you know, I probably should have spent a little more time studying. 
Um, but that ought to be some hope to folks who maybe aren't in the best position right now. Um, but it's never too late to turn it around. So, hmm. Cool, man. So, so you said you got into app, so you graduated from, and you went directly into college that, that following semester. Uh, so, um, yeah, I graduated O2, um, from Cherville high school. The following fall went straight into a four year university at Appalachian state in Boone in the mountains, North Carolina. Uh, and then I went, I did four years at Appalachian state, got my degree and, uh, it was roughly around the time of my sophomore and junior year, really, that I started looking at and preparing myself for law school. Uh, one of the things that you have to take um, is an admissions test. It's called the LSAT. Um, and it's a lot like the SAT or the ACT, um, the way that that is for, for college these days. Um, LSAT is something that you're expected to take when you before you apply to law school. You have to have an LSAT score and a solid GPA. And, and those two criteria are the main two criteria that law schools will look at as far as their admissions process. Uh, they'll also look at you know involvement um, there in school. And that's one of the things I did. I, I held down a part-time job at the same time that I was in college. Also uh, participated in a couple of clubs and organizations there on campus, student government, other things like that. Um, so I had a well-balanced resume when it came time to apply to law school. but. Um, the LSAT is one of those tests that's a standardized test. Uh, it's administered at most universities throughout the uh, United States. Um, there are plenty of prep courses. I didn't take one of the prep courses for the LSAT. I just bought a book and got some practice tests and studied that when I had free time and uh, took the practice test. And luckily I was able to just only have to take it one time and get a score that was good enough to to uh, put me on the map for the schools that I wanted to attend. So, uh, so where'd you go to law school? So I had the pleasure of attending the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I'm a Tar Hill. There I'm also go. a map, but uh, I, I lo grew up loving the Tar Hills. So to attend law school at UNC Chapel Hill was kind of a dream come true. Um, I started law school in August of 2006. That was just after the summer. Uh, summer after I graduated from app, I immediately jumped into it. It's one of those things, if you're going to make that type of investment uh, to become a lawyer, the earlier that you do it or you're able to, the better uh, off I think you'll be in the long term if that's something that you're sure you want to do. Um, but again, law school, it's a three-year commitment. I started in August um, and then I graduated in May of 2009. Um, but one of the things about being in law school, so law school uh, traditionally, and it's uh, right now, it's one of those things that's uh, uh, subject of a lot of debate about the law school curriculum. And especially the first year, you're just learning the basics, the rudimentary stuff, uh, property, torts, uh, criminal law, constitutional law. And then it's later in your second and third years that you look to more specific areas of the law, national security law or, or uh, environmental law, things of that nature. Um, but it's the summers where you receive arguably the most practical education when you're in law school is because um, usually you'll find an internship or a summer associateship working at a firm or working, uh, clerking for a judge. Uh, so after my first year of law school, I did a clerkship for an administrative law judge, uh, Judge Fred Morrison in Raleigh. And hmm. Administrative law judge hears all kinds of uh, appeals from government agencies. They're involved in environmental law, uh, employment law. Uh, we heard appeals from you know state troopers that argued they'd been wrongfully fired. The most interesting case that I've ever participated in was probably that summer, um, and that was a challenge to the North Carolina lethal injection, uh, the death penalty protocol. Uh, it's pretty much the drug cocktail that North Carolina was using at the time to. Uh, to execute inmates that were on that received the death penalty, and so we uh, heard a week-long trial uh, where um, advocates against the death penalty put on evidence uh, that the current injection protocol um, was unconstitutional. It was cruel and unusual punishment, and um, I worked with the judge that heard that case, Judge Morrison, and helped him or assisted him in drafting that decision. Um, 
that at the time kind of struck down uh, the legal uh, lethal injection protocol. Oh, it's one cool. of the cool things uh, that I've participated in and worked on. Um, but um, my second year of law school or between my second and third year, the cool thing about uh, going to law school is between your second and third year, you can actually practice uh, as long as you have a supervising attorney. And that's um, hmm. the way it is in North Carolina, at least I can't speak for other states, but between your second and third year of law school in North Carolina, under the, what they call the rising 3L practice rule, as long as you have someone kind of supervising you, you can practice law. And so between my second and third year of law school, I worked for the district attorney in Wake County, North Carolina, Raleigh. And uh, I prosecuted probably uh, thousands of misdemeanor cases in district court. Uh, it could have been anything from a registration infraction or speeding ticket all the way to DWI. In fact, I had 32 trials uh, that summer that I kept track of. And, wow. uh, and so that was a, a really a head start and a jump on my legal career before I was even licensed to practice and before I'd even graduated. And that made for a good experience when I came back from my 3 year. Absolutely, dude. I think it's probably one of the best internships available to law students is working in your local district attorney's office because um, they've got limited resources. They got an unlimited number of cases to work on. Um, and they're not afraid to put you in there and, and let you cut your teeth and try cases from day one. And so it was actually my very first day on my internship. I tried my first case. It was a seatbelt violation. Uh, but, um, you know, it's one of those things that to a law student's never tried a case before. It was exhilarating. So, I bet, dude. So, um, so, so how many years is law school? So law school, uh, for most folks, is a three-year commitment. And, uh, you know, you can all, just like undergrad, you can take extra courses during, uh, between your uh, summers or during your summers and, and get credits to where, where you can maybe graduate early. Um, I didn't do that. I opted for the more practical experience, the clerkships and the, and the internships. Um, as most of the, the folks that I went to school with did as well. Um, but uh, it's a three-year commitment if you, one of the things a lot of people do or some people do is they'll uh, join a, a, a JD, a Juris Doctorate, a law degree with like an MBA. And so they'll do a, a joint degree program. A lot of schools offer that. And so it'll turn law school into like a three year, from a three year to a four year commitment. And uh, I knew quite a few folks that did the JD MBA thing. I knew a couple that did a JD Masters in Health. And even one person who wanted to be a sports agent who did the JD and then a master's, I think, in sports and administration. So hmm. well, that's cool. But yeah, that's one of the cool things about a law degree is that just going to school doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be a lawyer. Uh, certainly doesn't mean you have to be a trial lawyer, um, but uh, it opens up a lot of doors for a lot of people. The question is, is uh, for students looking at going to law school, you got to look at you know, uh, the return on your investment because right. law was more expensive than, than ever before. So what are, what are some other opportunities that you've seen people go to after law school that wasn't just working in a court? So, um, I've seen people become sports agents, uh, I've seen folks go and work and administer nonprofits. Um, uh, even if you look at major sports and athletics, the PJ tour, um, there's a, a Carolina law grad that's one of the executive VPs of PGA Tour, Jim Delaney, who's the commissioner for the Big Ten Conference mm -hmm. Athletic, where Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State, all of those huge uh, collegiate programs. Mm -hmm. Delaney, um, he's actually a Carolina grad, uh, wow. law school grad, and pretty much you can, um, or you could use it to uh, get into business um, and, and end up working at. Uh, was in some in the corporate environment, um, but a lot of seen folks with law degrees do practically anything. Cool. Music and also yeah yeah copyright and all that stuff as well. I guess mm -hmm. right. Absolutely awesome. Um, so let's let's back it up and and from your high school through uh, throughout uh, law school, what were some of the most grueling things that you had to go to and then overcome? 
like the, the study schedule, like the, you know, like something like that, that you had to overcome to, to be successful. Yeah. High school, it was probably uh, the distractions, normal distractions that most teenagers face. So. Not, not me, right? Not... <laughs> uh, uh, girls, social life, that sort of thing. Yeah. Not, um, not me, not me, people. Yeah. I wasn't a distraction for Travis at all. Yeah, not at all. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, uh, let's see here. I think in high school, a lot of it was just, uh, you know, paying attention in class. Um, I mean, that was that was uh, one of the more difficult things that I did. Uh, but there were a few professors or, or teachers that really kept, did a good job of keep, or, you know, keeping us engaged. Mm. And that's thing. Um, we were very fortunate. I think it, we had some quality teachers at Cherville high school, but um, you know, the SAT, uh, those things aren't, aren't fun at all. Uh, college um, at Appalachian, just adjusting to, uh, a new setting, uh, making new friends. Uh, I think in college, related to my degree, one of the more difficult things was the LSAT. Um, and I actually remember um, uh, backtracking a little bit there in college. I remember the first time that I went to, um, you know, most schools will do career fairs and grad school fairs. And that's the first time that I ever talked to anybody from Carolina Law School or from any law school for that matter. And I remember uh, getting like the uh, application packet and talking to it was Dean Michael States, the Dean of Admissions at Carolina at the time. He was there at Appalachian for a college fair, and he was telling me all the things I was going to have to do to uh, to admit it to the school or, or to be a candidate. And the LSAT, the GPA requirement, all of those things. And I just remember feeling, you know, thinking of how overwhelming that was, and like, like holy cow, am I really going to be able to pull this off? And uh, but that's one of the things. If you just focus on one thing at a time, uh, right. you know, they focused on on the grades, one class at a time, one assignment at a time. Uh, and then I found time uh, around my junior year to you know designate some time for the LSAT, uh, practice it. Um, it's really just putting in the work, and that's the hardest thing. Is just if you don't, if you haven't developed the work uh, ethic, and and by that. I think I said in high school, I pretty much did enough just to get by and I didn't have much of a work ethic or at least my work ethic, what I did have wasn't commendable. Mm -hmm. uh, starting to develop one, that was one of the toughest things. And uh, you just did it one task at a time and that was the, the best way to get through that. Yeah, I think um, time management's one of the biggest things that you learn in college period. Yeah, time management, it, it's one of those skills that it doesn't matter what career you're in. Uh, you're going to need it, but in law, especially the type of work that I do, litigation, time management is the most crucial thing um, that I need to have because um, I'm a civ I practice in civil litigation, mm -hmm. I'm a trial in, in civil litigation, just like criminal lit litigation also. I also do some criminal defense. There are all kinds of deadlines, and if, I, if I'm late on responding to a lawsuit, that could cost my client then their entire case it could cost them their house. It could cost them tens or if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm. If I don't file a motion at appropriate time, I may not get to make an argument that is potentially a winning argument. Um, and so you've got to be able to keep track of, of that, stay on top of things. Um, one of the most important things, and it doesn't matter what career is to follow up with people, uh, return phone calls, return emails, uh, be punctual, those skill sets, um, you know, those are things that you really have to work on and, and make sure that, um, and to a lot of folks, they'll come naturally, but, um, but those are the things that employers and clients and your colleagues really look at. And, but going back to one of the more difficult things, the most difficult thing that I think most lawyers will ever do is, is take the bar exam. And so in North Carolina, uh, the bar exam you take it after you graduated from law school. So the summer of 2009 was when I took the uh, bar exam. It's offered two times a year in North Carolina, once in July and once in February. And typically the, the February exam is what a lot of lawyers and law students will say, that's the exam for the people that failed the July exam. And so I didn't want to be taken in February. I wanted to pass it in July. Um, and if just the pressure of passing the bar exam wasn't enough, 
for me, I had uh, some kind of extraordinary circumstances that particular year, right around graduation, my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Mm. And um, so I knew going into that summer, one, it was going to be a heavy summer. I'd be spending a lot of time at home. But also, um, my dad's birthday was around uh, Labor Day. In fact, it's coming up uh, August the 30th. And uh, But I knew that we would be getting our bar results right around the same time as his birthday. And so what I wanted to do, I wanted to be able to surprise my dad for his birthday uh, with a letter from State Bar telling him that his son was going to be a lawyer. And so the entire summer... Um, that was one of my goals is to, you know, I added a little extra pressure because not only was it just for me and my career, but I wanted to, it to be a very special birthday gift for my dad mm. on it, what could have been his last birthday. Um, and so um, the way I recommend going about the bar and the way I did it is, um, you know, I said earlier, I didn't take an LSAT prep course. I think for, um, for most practitioners sitting for the bar exam it's very wise to take a bar brie or or any other type of bar prep course and that'll kind of give you a guide for your studies and keep you on track and uh, give you some organization to it because you're expected to know anywhere from 10 to 13 areas of the law and you don't know within those areas you don't uh, know what they're going to ask you about um, and so you'll have one criminal law question and for that one question, you need to know the entirety of North Carolina criminal law. Same thing for constitutional law, family law, every one of those topics. And um, so what I did that summer is I treated studying for the bar like an eight to five job. Uh, went to class at eight o'clock, my bar prep course. I think we were done around lunchtime from that and then had a lunch. Then one o'clock, I was back at the library studying. Five o'clock, I went to the gym. And then from uh, you know eight o'clock to bedtime, um, I'd eat some snacks, eat some junk food, um, and then do a couple practice tests. And I did that Monday through Friday. On Friday afternoon, I'd go uh, home for the weekend, spend time with my dad. I wouldn't touch a book, wouldn't look at it, and then come back Monday and be ready to do it again and uh, would be refreshed from the weekend off. I think that's one of the things, too, it's important not only in your studies, but in the practice of law too. And um, one of the more difficult things about the practice of law is that it's so, uh, there's so much pressure to perform. It's an adversarial legal system. And so you're constantly in competition with people mm -hmm. and for people um, that puts a lot of uh, outside or, or exterior pressures on them uh, on the work. And uh, so the legal profession, it's one of the professions where you have the high, one of the highest rates of suicide and drug abuse and alcohol abuse. Really? Uh, yeah. People think that um, you know, they watch, they watch the law and order or they watch, um, you know, suits or something like that. And they think being a lawyer is, you know, the great life and you're going to make tons of money. Uh, you're never going to have any stress. It's just arguing for the fun of it back and forth. But, you know, I think a lot of lawyers put a lot of pressure on themselves to perform for their clients to get great results. If you care about your clients and care about your work, I think you know, it's going to be natural that you take on some of those pressures. And so I think it's very important uh, to maintain a good work-life balance. And that's one of the things where a lot of professionals uh, struggle with doing. And, and so with the larger firms that in corporate America, you, you see, a lot of associates starting out working 70 and 80 hour weeks and mm. they just told because there's no downtime uh, they eat you can breathe the law and and don't have much of a personal life and after a while that can be very taxing yeah burnout's got to be a, a big a big issue Absolutely. that comes up so yeah i mean that's not i don't think that's just law either i usually i mean i think of it like this like i mean it, i know it's the more responsibility you have in your job, the more you're going to end up having to bring it home a little bit. But the more separation you have, I think, for your mental health, the, the better. If you can separate right. those two, because you don't want to agree. You, yeah. you need to have things. You know, it's great for everybody to work in a job that you enjoy, that's your passion. Um, you know, I highly recommend that. But even then, uh, doing the same thing every day is is going to. Uh, grow on you and if you that's all you do every day um then you're going to get tired of it eventually and so i think it's important 
to connect with, with either family, friends, have a hobby, uh, something that you do on the side. For me, I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time with my family on the weekends, uh, with friends, uh, and I like to cut grass too. Just something where I, for two or three hours, I can do something menial and, uh, and not have to think about anything. Right. Just think about whether or not I'm mowing straight lines in the yard. <laughs> You know, yeah. finding a release like that, um, I, I think it just gives my mind a break. And and I need that because I'm thinking of ways to outsmart the lawyer on the other side the rest of the week. And usually, like, those big breakthroughs come when you're doing those, like, in Absolutely. the shower or mowing the grass or something like that, right? I know but if I'm, I'm, like, I'm working gonna... on a problem, like, and I'm stuck and I just hit a wall it'll walk in my dog or mowing the grass or something. It's like, Oh, there it comes. You know, like, uh, there's the answer. And it's yeah, uh, some of my best, uh, legal arguments have been, uh, laying in bed right as, after I've woken up or right mm -hmm. in the shower or even on, uh, the mower. And, uh, you know, some of my best closing arguments I've ever given awesome. in those, in those times. Um, all right. So, who do you think was the most influential person throughout your education? Like if you could name, I know there's probably a whole team of them, but if there was one person that you could name that had the most influence on you, who would that be? Uh, it's kind of funny. So, um, you know, one part of it is probably my uncle Ben. Uh, he worked in the district attorney's office up in Boone uh, when I was growing up and when I was really young. And, and so I'd spent a lot of time in the courthouse with him um or there in the da's office he'd take me around and i always thought that was kind of cool uh but then one of our classmates too i'll give him a shout out brent hauser since he got just was married this past weekend but we were sitting in 11th grade english and and i hadn't really thought too much about what i wanted to do i growing up i kind of said i wanted to be an archaeologist and dig for dinosaurs uh, but uh brent came into class one day and he said you know i'm going to uh, such and such school, and then I'm going to go to such and such school. Um, after getting a political science degree, I'm going to go to law school. And so he, he kind of said the poli sci law school track, and I kind of thought about it. I was like, yeah, you know what? That's actually a pretty good. That sounds fun. It sounds like something I'd be into. And uh, and so that I'd say I'd give Brent a little credit, um, just like my uncle. And then I, I think, you know, generally my family, um, those Sunday afternoon discussions around the dinner table played a whole role in, in me wanting or having taken the interest in the law and, and also politics. So hmm. that's cool. I, I, I never thought that Brent Hauser might have been like your, your biggest, uh, uh, one of your biggest influence. That's crazy. Um, yeah, it, it really is crazy. And it's just one of those things that kind of stuck with me. It was the offhand comment made around 8 30 one, one morning in class. And I'm like, hmm. you know what? like a pretty good idea that's awesome um so what did you do after law school and why did you make that decision all right so i mentioned earlier that um i had interned between my second and third year of law school um uh, with the wake county district attorney's office mm -hmm. and um you know i going into law school i saw myself as more of a transactional attorney um, I'd said that I, want, I wanted to do real estate. I didn't see myself as being a matlock or being someone in the courtroom arguing and trying cases. Uh, somewhat of a laid back personality and like to see folks get along. Um, and real estate and transactional work was something where, hey, you know, people, have, they're putting a deal together. All you're doing is closing it. Everybody's happy, that sort of thing. Well, uh, working in the district attorney's office kind of opened my eyes to uh, trial work and mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And so I kind of thought that if I couldn't get on with the DA's office, then I'd you know, branch out to, um, you know, criminal defense practice and, and become a trial lawyer, defense attorney. And so after law school, um, I got my bar results in uh, August, September, and, and I passed. And that was great. Gave the <laughs> card to my dad with my bar letter. And that was a great moment. Awesome. Uh, but for a month or two, uh, I waited around to hear back from DA's offices. I sent uh, letters and uh, resumes and that sort of thing and, and looked at every criminal defense uh, office. I wanted to kind of stay around Charlotte and the Gaston County area if I could. And so I was sending letters to 
anybody that I could find on the internet that had a law office that did criminal defense. I'd send a cover letter and a resume, you know, express an interest, even if they didn't have a job posting or not, I wanted to let them know that I was interested if they, uh, should they ever think of it. And um, I was down at Folly Beach and I got a phone call from Colin Willoughby, the elected district attorney in Wake County. And he offered me a job and it was um, October of 2009. And so I uh, took two weeks to pack up my belongings, find a place to live in Raleigh, and then I was sworn in, I think it was October 26, 2009, as an assistant district attorney. And so I worked there for a year. I prosecuted uh, thousands of uh, infractions, misdemeanors. And, um, I didn't try any felonies or anything while I was there. I was simply a district court district attorney. I uh, tried a lot of DWIs. That was the main thing that I, I, I tried. Most of the other cases, they plead out or something like that. You work something out, but DWIs, I, I seem to try the most of and, and had a good time trying those. So, you know, I've heard a lot of lawyers say if you could try a DWI, then you can try a murder case because uh, DWIs are, are fairly complex. You've got the field sobriety tests, you've got um, blood results, breath results, and laying the foundation to make sure that um, that evidence is admissible and the judge gets to hear it. And so uh, I really enjoyed trying DWIs, did that for a year, and then dad's health took a turn for a worse. And so I was able, fortunately, to transfer to the district attorney's office in Gaston County. And so I was a prosecutor in Gaston County for another two years before uh, being hired by the managing partner at my current firm. And I've been there for seven years. And um, the practice that I joined, it's Arthur's and Foltz uh, in Gastonia. They've been around for a long time, um, since the late 80s. And uh, before I came along, they were primarily a civil litigation, domestic uh, divorce, uh, and real estate firm. They didn't have any kind of criminal defense background. Um, and so I was able to bring that to the practice, uh, practicing criminal defense, but I was also able to learn from Doug uh, and, and Britt, my law partners, to Nancy Foltz, how to practice in civil court. And uh, and I would say probably right now, the majority of my practice is um, in civil litigation. And it could be, when you say civil litigation, it could be anything from neighbors not getting along, having a, a boundary dispute. So a fight over real estate, mm -hmm. a fight for business dealings or uh, collections, uh, people owing someone money. Um, it could be folks fighting over a will. That's one of my favorite types of cases is estate cases where family members or or people are fighting over an inheritance. Um, those are usually uh, interesting cases to deal with because not only do you get to know your clients, but you get to know this decedent, uh, the person who's died, and, and you're trying to piece together what it is that they wanted um, and, and whether or not they were able to, to execute the document or sign the will that one side's claiming that they were able to do. Hmm. And you really learn a lot about people. The main thing that I enjoy about being a lawyer uh, in my practice is just being able to help people. Um, one of the terms, so lawyers have a bunch of different names. Uh, some I can't say on your, your, your show, um, a lawyer, attorney, but one of the things that kind of stands out and the one that I think people sometimes overlook is the word counselor. Um, you know, people come into our office and they've got a huge burden or a huge problem that they've been dealing with. And I think one of the, the worst things about having a problem is just not knowing what's going to happen the uncertainty. All right. And so as an attorney, I really try to take it upon myself to, you know, tell people what's going on, explain to them uh, so they understand, you know, why you're being sued or, or what the other side's asking for or what we can do about your problem and give them an expectation of what's going to happen. Explain, you know, this is the procedure. This is how long it, it may likely take. And this is what, based on my experience, what may likely happen if you take this case to a judge or jury. And, uh, and so we counsel folks and we help them through their, their problems. And, you know, the majority of cases in America are settled either, you know, in criminal court, it's by a guilty plea to some kind of charge or reduced charge. Um, in civil cases, it's going to be some kind of monetary settlement or, or some type of settlement uh, where someone agrees to do something. And, uh, and so I would say between 95 and 99% of cases criminally and civilly are resolved out of court 
without a trial. Um, and so, um, and that's where you really trying to formulate some kind of settlement or a plea and, and talking to your clients. That's really where you do most of the counseling work. And, and that's a lot of fun. Um, just that this is a question just out of my own curiosity. So from your time dealing with the court system and our judicial system, if there was one thing that you see a deficient and one area that, you know, there's a deficiency at and you could change it, what would it be? And what would you do? Um, uh, let's see, I would probably, it'd probably have to be the access to quality representation. Um, uh, there are a lot of folks, I mean, there's a limited number of resources. Um, North Carolina, we have a public defender uh, system. Gaston County has a public defender. Um, and that's folks who are appointed lawyers um, by the court when they can't afford an attorney. And they have a constitutional right to attorney. Um, but on the civil side, there is no such constitutional right uh, to an attorney. And so there are a lot of folks that simply can't afford an attorney. And I think that's probably one of the deficiencies um, with the practice of law and, and the legal profession is just the access to good quality representation. And folks, and, and there are a lot of um, folks out there that go to an attorney and, and the attorney isn't able to help them and, and maybe gives them bad advice. And But I think that's probably a much smaller problem than the overall issue of just folks not being able to afford an attorney. And, and when folks don't afford attorney or can't afford attorney and don't hire an attorney, a lot of times they end up with bad results. And, and you see a lot of injustice play out in the court system. And it's really just because of the access to quality representation. And um, you've got great agencies like Legal Aid that will help folks um, with domestic restraining orders and things like that. Uh, but they're very limited in the areas where they can help folks. And so, and I think it's important for lawyers to do a little bit of pro bono uh, when they're able to. Yeah, again, you have, you know, you have employees, you, you have a staff. If you're like me and you're you're an office, so you have bills to pay, and you, you have folks that depend upon you earning an income. And to do that, you have to charge uh, a fair price for your representation. But at the same time, and I think it's important for a lawyer to give back a little bit of their time uh, and pro bono. I've done that. Um, quite a few times myself and uh, you know help some folks it could be a zoning issue or something like that uh, but I think it's one of those things that lawyers need to take it upon themselves to to give back to their time and, and really serve the public so how, what, what's the percentage you think of uh, lawyers that actually do pro bono work is it fairly high uh, man I have no idea um what that percentage is well, just off I, the top of your head. Like, what do, what do you think? I'd say just from experience with the local bar, probably the greater, it's more likely that they don't, I'd say maybe 75 mm -hmm. or 80, 20. Um, and it's just because one, the legal profession is a very demanding job. Right. Um, and, uh, a lot of pressure and why take on a lot of lawyers will say, why take on that headache or that extra pressure, uh, when, you're not going to, there's no tangible result or they'll argue there's no tangible result uh, as far as money or benefit to their firm or their practice. And, uh, but sometimes it's just about helping somebody in need. So have you ever uh, witnessed any judgments um, or um, what the, what's the word? Uh, 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 verdicts or rulings. Verdicts, there you go. Uh, verdicts that, that you knew like, in your heart, you knew that it was unfair and it was unjust. And how did you deal with that? Um, I've, I've been lucky um, that I really haven't um, seen that happen. I've seen, um, I've represented a couple people uh, where I thought they should have been found not guilty uh, and they weren't. Um, and, and it's one of those things you kind of, you'll stew on it for a long time. Um, if not forever, you know, thinking about that. One of the biggest uh, things that I talk about sometimes, or the, the client that scares me the most, especially on the criminal side, is the client that I truly believe is innocent. And, uh, and I'm out to prove their innocence, essentially. Um, 
and, and, and I've got to make sure that they're found not guilty. Um, you know, it's, there's pressure enough just on a typical case, but when you have a client that you truly believe in, truly believe they're innocent, um, then the stakes get infinitely higher and you're thinking about that case all the time. Um, I've been fortunate with the cases where I've had that client that I truly believe is innocent um, and I've been able to get their charges dismissed. Um, sometimes it's been a lot harder. I had one client in particular that was charged with felony criminal charges, um, you know, um, an ex spouse or, um, ex paramour took out allegations that they had broken into, uh, that particular person's house. And my client had an airtight alibi, uh, was at the gym 45 minutes away when it happened. Um, uh, and we had his, uh, login information from where he'd been in the gym. We also had the, the Google data from his phone uh, showing where he was. And so, um, you know, it, it took a lot longer than what I had hoped, but we were able to finally convince the prosecutor that that uh, this was a bogus charge. This was a spite warrant um, taken out by someone who was angry that uh, my client wasn't with them anymore. Mm. And um, you know, that's one of the things about the prosecutor position is that they have a great bit of responsibility uh, in making sure that the case that they've been handed by the police department is uh, well-founded in the facts and then supported by the evidence. And I think you're seeing a lot of, there's been a huge movement, I think, in the past 10 or 15 years uh, where you've seen uh, just in North Carolina along the creation of the Innocence Commission a commission dedicated solely to uh, overturning wrongful convictions. And uh, it's one of the things I'm kind of proud of with the, our legal community is, is that they've really taken that efforts to uh, overturn wrongful convictions. And, uh, yeah. Cause you're saying you're, you're saying people being free, you know, all the charges dismissed after being in jail for 20, 30 years. 20, 30 yeah. Years. That's yeah. correct. And, uh, but um, and I, I'm very fortunate. I work in a jurisdiction where we have a, a really good prosecution, uh, prosecutor's office. My, many of the prosecutors that are there in the office are the same ones that I worked with uh, seven and eight years ago. And so I think they do a good job. We also have pretty good law enforcement here in Gaston County um, that are pretty honest and straightforward. And I will, uh, I, I will say I've met uh, a few of them now, and every one of them has been pretty st stand up people. So. Um, yeah. kudos to Gaston County's, uh, law enforcement. Yeah, I, I, I like to think that we do it right in Gaston County. Uh, you know, there's always room for improvement anywhere, but, uh, and I, as a lawyer, as a citizen, you should always welcome improvement and progress. Um, uh, but, but yeah. Awesome. All right. You so know, next question, uh, any cases that you are the most proud of that you are able to tell us about? Uh, one of the cases that I touched on earlier, that was the, uh, uh, when I clerked for the administrative law judge and um, they looked at the lethal injection protocol and it was a challenge to the death penalty. And so that was uh, one of the most fascinating cases I ever worked on. In fact, as part of that, um, I crafted a legal opinion and, and a memorandum that allowed the judge on his own motion to go and visit the death chamber at Central Prison in Raleigh. And so we, he and I actually took a tour of the death chamber there at Central Prison and uh, got to stand right next to the gurney where, where folks have been executed. And it's a very somber place. Um, but that's probably one of the more fascinating things that I've done in 10 years of practicing law. Now, speak, I've had speak, speaking of that, actually, um, I just remember, I remember seeing something that that's that come up in the news again fairly recently. I think there's been some chemical or in there that's that's in, in the mm -hmm. cocktail that's um basically paralyzes you and like but causes yeah. like intense pain and, and you can't do anything yeah. about it and, and that's kind of the evidence that we heard about the cocktail that they were using at the time you know i specifically remember one veterinarian taking the stand and testifying and saying that you know we put down uh animals in a more humane manner than what we're uh, uh putting down people Wow. and uh, about the method in which he euthanized uh, folks' pets. Uh, and, uh, but 
And I, I, there's been a, most states I have a moratorium. North Carolina's had a moratorium. We haven't executed anybody uh, in a long period of time. Uh, and uh, what you're seeing with respect to the drugs, the drug manufacturers are actually refusing to sell their product to a lot of states if they know that those drugs are going to be used for an ex or an execution. And so, you know, I, you know, I don't think it's, uh, you know, without giving an opinion one way or the other on the death penalty as a whole, I, I think the death penalty, um, I'd be surprised if it's around, uh, just generally in 10, 15 years, uh, probably be something that we're not even talking about anymore. Hmm. Um, so what were you saying the next one of uh, the other cases? So, uh, you know, one of the other cases I had uh, is one of my uh, first civil jury trials. Uh, and it was a case where we, uh, uh, my client had been, uh, his relationship, he, he worked uh, and sold products on a commission for a couple of companies. And those companies went under and he was left uh, holding the bag on a bunch of uh uh, commissions and so I was able to try that to case to a jury and even though the companies were able to go they had gone out of business I was able actually to hold the owners of the company personally liable for the monies that my client was due and we call that uh, piercing the corporate veil and it's something that's fairly hard to do it's something that I'm fairly proud of though uh, you know it, it was one of those things where I was able to convince a jury to do the just result and do what uh, was right. And, uh, and so I was very happy to, about that one. Um, client was happy and uh, still to this day have a relationship with that client. And uh, awesome. it's one of those cases I'm proud of. Uh, I was even discouraged in that case, uh, thinking that, you know, it might've been a long shot. Maybe we should settle. I uh, didn't necessarily like the facts uh, of our case. I knew it was gonna be very, very hard to, to prove that the owners of the company were individually liable and that, uh, you know, the company's own bankruptcy essentially shouldn't bar my client's claims, but uh, was able to convince a jury of 12 Gaston County uh, folks that, uh, that this man should be held accountable for, for stiff and my client. And so very proud of that one. Not many people can say that they've convinced a jury to pierce the corporate veil. And, wow. and I'm happy. Yeah, I was actually I was actually just thinking that in my head. I, if we weren't going to get to it, I was going to ask you off camera if you've ever had to go up against a corporation. Um, just because I worked for a large corporation, I know they have a massive legal team usually. So yeah. um, to be able to to do that, it's amazing. Um, all right, so let's uh, wrap it up and then get to Q and A. But before I want to say, uh, I just want to see if uh, if anybody's looking into studying law, are there any materials that you can recommend? Books, podcasts, whatever. So, um, you know, definitely as you're looking um, for the practice, well, there's a, there's a, a blog uh, called Above the Law, I believe. Uh, and, and that's a pretty interesting blog. Um, and it follows uh, different stories uh, of, and it follows really closely the big firm life. And so you get a picture of what it's like to work for one of the larger firms. Uh, in the country and, and so there's a lot of posts about uh, lawyers in that and uh, conversations within that community on that blog about practicing law you know if you're looking at uh, taking the LSAT I highly recommend some of those study materials the LSAT materials uh, get your practice tests they, they sell previous tests that have been administered and so you can actually purchase an actual test and, and take it and practice on it and so I recommend doing that if you're looking at, uh, you know, applying to law school in the near future. Uh, you know, some of my favorite uh, legal movies, My Cousin Vinny, I love that movie. <laughs> I think that's a great one. Uh, that's a good one. You know, and, and surprisingly, it's one of the, the films that I think is more closely aligned with actual practice. Uh, the Verdict, I believe, uh, is a pretty good film. Cool. All right, so let's jump into some uh, Q and A. All right, so let's see. All right, how did you decide which branch of law to pursue? Okay, so um, 
you know, originally I went into law school thinking that I was going to be a transactional attorney. I was going to work at a desk most of the time. And, and that really changed when I did uh, my internship uh, with the Wake County District Attorney's Office and got to experience the other side of actual trial practice and be a trial player, I got to see that firsthand and, and, and try it. And so, you know, I would really encourage folks in law school or, or looking at becoming a lawyer to take advantage of every internship and practical experience that you can uh, and look at a different variety of internships or, or practices, you know, clerk for a judge, uh, work in a public sector, a public defender's office or a district attorney's office for a little bit. Um, you know, I also interned with the North Carolina Attorney General's office while I was in school. So uh, I also worked in the juvenile justice clinic, a third year law school. So do things like that, take advantage of opportunities to volunteer, to intern. Um, there are some paid internships and summer associateships available um you know but look for different try different things uh that's the best way that i can say that's what worked for me you know i clerked for a judge my first summer i enjoyed that got to see some trial practice and then um you know, the next summer i worked in the da's office and you know, i never thought i would enjoy being a trial lawyer and arguing in front of people because i don't really like to argue in my personal life but uh but i enjoy it and it's fun love the theater uh, of going to court and putting on your case and making a good, compelling argument. Um, and I didn't realize that I would enjoy that until I actually tried it. So take advantage of every internship. Cool. Um, did joining clubs in college pertaining to law help you uh, get internships? Um, I think it, it did. Um, at Appalachian, so we had a pre-law track. I would say that in itself, that pre-law focus or concentration helped me more in law school um, than anything else though. Um, internships and clubs, those were great. And there's some clubs and organizations like mock trial and things like that. I think those are good to get in. Uh, but what helped me personally the most was taking criminal law, taking administrative law, taking constitutional law, those legal courses in undergrad so I was already, I already knew how to brief a case. I already knew how to terminology. Uh, I knew the court structure, how our courts were situated in North Carolina, federal courts. I knew all of those things before I went to law school. And so I really had a leg up on most of my classmates because they had just studied a, you know, typical bachelor of arts. They may have even had, you know, a Spanish degree or, um, some, a liberal arts major that, philosophy or something that wasn't really related to the law at all. Uh, and so I thought I had a huge advantage on a lot of my classmates just from day one uh, by knowing the lingo, knowing how to brief a case, knowing how to read a case, because that's really how you learn the law in law school is just by reading other court decisions and talking mm -hmm. about them. And uh, you learn the rules from those cases. Uh, and so I already knew how to do that by learning how to do that in undergrad. And I thought that was a huge advantage. A couple of other um, undergraduate approaches that I think are very helpful. I think English degrees, um, you know, a lot of lawyers, um, or a lot of folks underestimate how much the law is reading and writing. And, and the better writer you are, the better advocate that you're going to be as an attorney, the better uh, taking public speaking classes. That's one of the things I took. I took that and took debate while I was at App. Um, I knew, I kind of figured out early on an app what I needed to do to become a good lawyer or, or to try to become a good lawyer. I needed to learn how to speak. I needed to learn how to write uh, and I needed to know the law. And so I took classes that I thought were going to help me. Yeah, I took uh, fencing and I took, uh, I think, snowboarding an app. Um, but I also took classes that, I, that were going to have some practical experience and now, not everyone I realize is going to have that luxury because you're still just figuring out what it is that you want to do. And you may not even know until after undergrad. Um, but, you know, I think those classes will also help. Another class I think helped too with law school was taking logic. Um, that really helped um, with the LSAT. Dude, I think so logic was one of the most useful classes I've ever taken and just period. 
like yeah, being able to exactly. being able to just be like okay that guy's bs and you know like it's just, yeah. That, uh, yeah that's cool okay all right let's move on to the next one and get you uh wrapped up and back to your family um can you practice law outside of the state and outside of or outside of the u.s or is it just by state so typically um in the united states um you're going to be uh, licensed by a state and so right now i'm only licensed by north carolina i can only practice in north carolina now if i wanted to i think i could wave into if i can move to another state and i could wave in i wouldn't have to sit for their for the bar exam it depends on the state you know a lot of states once you have five years of experience or a certain amount of experience um, they'll let you come into their state and begin to practice the law simply by registering um, and maybe taking their specific ethics exam because there's two exams the bar exam and the ethics exam that you've got to take uh, for most jurisdictions and uh, or for most states and um, they might take you one of or make you take one of those exams like such as the ethics exam but yeah there's you've really got to apply for a whole new license when you go to another state to practice now there's a process called pro hoc vice where a lawyer from say Florida or New York could come to North Carolina and practice but they have to be approved by the court for that particular case and they have to have a local lawyer sponsor them uh, for them to be able to practice and that sponsoring a lawyer has to sit there and supervise them while they're in court. Cool. Um, wow. Yeah. I, I figured that's what the case was um, state by state. Uh, all right. So what's the number one tip you would give to a pre-law student? Uh, go to med school. <laughs> that's a good one. I, I'm kidding. Uh, no, you know, the number one uh, you know, develop time management. We talked about that earlier, you know, focus on time management. And as part of time management, make sure that you have, you know, things that, you know, hobbies, things that are important to your family, and make sure that you protect that time, you know, even you're in law school, and then in your practice, make sure you, you still continue to a lot time to spend with your family or your friends, or your golf game, or your yard or whatever it is that you do where you find happiness, make sure that you continue to do that. Cool. Um, all right. Two more on average, how long are your cases from first meeting to verdict? Okay. So it depends on the type of case. Obviously that's a classic lawyer. It, it depends. Um, but I would say, uh, and it also will change for the jurisdiction too. I mean, some States are quicker and faster resolving cases, but criminal cases, usually I can get them resolved if it's a misdemeanor, for example, non-DWI misdemeanor, I can get those resolved in two or three months, maybe four months. Um, DWIs have the tendency to last anywhere from six months to a year. Uh, a lot of my big civil cases, they'll last anywhere from six months to a year, maybe even two years. Um, and it's just because of civil cases tend to move a little slower just because the rules uh kind of dictate that they do when you sue someone you have 30 days to respond to that lawsuit uh, you can ask the court for additional 30 days um, and then the same thing when you're sending out discovery and doing all of these other things uh, you know the, the rules themselves don't necessarily f uh, facilitate a quick resolution of a case one of the things i try to do is when I meet with a client, you know, I use this analogy a lot. I say, look, I'm the bus driver. You tell me where you want the bus to go and I'll do my best to get you there. And I, uh, if I see a way to get them to that point without incurring the expenses of litigation, I usually try to push them in that direction or, or steer the bus in that direction. If, um, you know, I tend to look for a settlement or a quick dismissal or a quick resolution of the case when I can, um, because again, the worst thing about anything is waiting, not knowing. And so the, the sooner that you get folks answers and resolution, the better it is. Cool. Uh, all right. Last one, which is actually now that they've asked it, I want to know the weirdest law, you know, bird law, the what? <laughs> no, that was a, it's always sunny in Philadelphia reference bird yeah. law. Um, let's see. Um, you know, off the top of my head. 
I wish I had thought about this earlier, but um, you know, in North Carolina for a long time, and I think it's still the case, it was a class two misdemeanor to not sign your registration card. And so it's just as serious for you to not sign your registration card as it was for you to punch someone in the face. <laughs> Wow, that's nuts. Yeah. All right, man. Well, let me get you back uh, to your family. I know it's getting late, but thank you so much for taking the time. And we'll get together soon and uh, do our annual uh, Christmas thing as well, man. All right. Well, thanks, Jay, again for having me. I appreciate it. If anyone uh, has any other questions, you're welcome to look me up at my firm. It's Arthur's and Fultz and Gastonia. Happy to communicate via email or you can give me a call. So, uh, Jay, thanks again for having me. Yeah, no problem. And like like you said, reach out to him if you need anything, guys. Um, all right, man. We'll talk to you later. Hope you have a good night. All right, you too. All right, bye. See you. Best guy ever. What a sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs>